I talked to my next guest about five years ago about Next Gen Energy, and he said at the time it had all the hallmarks of a huge winner, and he turned out to be right. Joining me now is Warren Irwin, President and CIO of Russo Asset Management. Good to see you, sir. Great to see you, Mark. Thanks for having me on. So let's go back to that that conversation and, and the article that uh, that I wrote based on uh, on your information. You called it a next gen, a once in a generation opportunity. At the time, it was trading about two dollars. It eventually got near eight. Now it's around five thirty. Uh, you used to hold about ten percent of the company. You've pared that back, yep. and you said just the other day you you've probably made about a hundred million dollars on next gen. So from from then to now. Has next gen story played out pretty well as you expected? I'm a little bit just disappointed on the price movement. I thought that if you found the world's biggest and richest uranium deposit, it would do better than going from the 60 cents where I bought it. And I'll tell you, when I bought it at 60 cents, I was just being the biggest cheapskate in the market out there. So I hoovered up uh, about 10% of the company at around 60 cents, try and get as cheap as I possibly could. And to have uh, you know less than a 10 bagger uh, on the world's biggest and richest uranium discovery, I think is pretty lame. Uh, I would have imagined considerably more. And not only is it monumental in the uranium space, but it's one of the most economic mines of any commodity globally. And it's an excellent jurisdiction in northern Saskatchewan. Right, so what's holding it back, do you think? You know, it's difficult to say. I, the, the uranium market is pretty funny here, and um, it's really tough to predict. And, uh, but, you know, I think, um, I think right now, actually, what's holding it back now is it's kind of, kind of into, the, into the Lausanne curve. They're, they're getting ready, they're working on permitting and getting into production. So they're in this bit of a quiet period just before, uh, in the years before production. And it's usually a pretty lousy time for a, for a stock performance. But, you know, I've, over the years, I've learned that now is the time to buy pre-production, high-quality uh, mines. Now is really the time to start hoovering this paper up. I'd like to know more about your research process because um, at the time, originally, um, NextGen said we probably have about a 200 million pound resource. Yep. Uh, and you said, based on your research and what you and your team had done, it could be at 350 million pounds. And they're kind of close to that now with the current estimate. I think it's like just under 340. So it measured, indicated, uh, and, and inferred. So. What, what edge do you think uh, you have in the marketplace with your research process? And how do you, how do you approach a company and how do you approach a, a research in general? Well, in the case of NextGen, what we did is uh, we came out with a 200 million pound estimate initially prior to their initial estimate, which came out a few months later and it came out around 200 million pounds. How we came to that estimate is we plotted every single drill hole manually because the, the tricky part of NextGen is the first time ever I dealt with directional drilling. So you'd have they're not just straight holes down a fence line and they're, they're zipping off this way, zipping off that way. So we had to manually draw these holes the best we could based on description of the company. So we came up with uh, you know, every single fence line, plotted every single hole, calculated every single little interval, the tonnage, and we came up with 200 million pounds about two or three months before SRK did. Meanwhile, the rest of the market was about 50 million pounds. So it was a material difference. Interesting. And, and so do you have a philosophy when it comes to your research? Yeah, well, basically what I try and do is, uh, I, I'm not the kind of guy who could sit there on, on television and talk about a hundred different names. I'm very much focused. I, I like, um, what works for me anyways, is just focusing on a smaller number of companies, digging as deep as I can, and really, really understanding things. And that's that's worked for me for the past, you know, many decades uh, investing in the resource space. Yeah. Also going back to our previous conversation, you thought that uh, NextGen was a logical takeover candidate. You yeah. also posed that maybe an oil and gas company comes along. Do you still believe that? Absolutely. Yeah. I think the fact that Suncor hasn't stepped up and bought it is, in, 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 in hindsight, you know, 10 or 20 years from now, the people will look at it as one of the biggest mistakes. Because I think, you know, Suncor, the name is Suncor Energy. What do they do? They mine energy. They're the, one of the few oil companies in the world to actually mine their oil. And NextGen uses the same town, Fort McMurray, as a, as a stepping off point for their project. And they're just, there's apparently a road being built now, or it's already been built now, from Fire, Fireweed, one of their projects in eastern Alberta, to NextGen. There's a road that can get them there. So they're right in their neighborhood. It's extraordinary. They're able to mine energy and it's non-CO2 generating. So for Suncor, the, the story would be, uh, we're producing, um, we produce energy. If you want uranium, oil, whatever you want, we have it for you, let mm -hmm. the customer decide, yeah. 
No, we'll see. Um, now, so next gen plans to start production when? Oh, well, uh, like roughly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it'll be a few years out. Yeah, they're, okay. they're dealing with some permitting issues now, and they'll, they'll, uh, they're, they're, I believe they're doing some pre pre construction work right now, but and uh, they're working on some permitting, and there's a number of things in the pipeline, predicting it'll be a number of years of down the pipe here. Okay, so 25, 26, something around. <laughs> yeah, let, or let's not even. <laughs> I'm not even going to go there. <laughs> okay, no. fair no. enough. No. But 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 you can you continue to hold next gen. Yeah. But what what are the uh, uh, what are the benefits of holding it long term? Well, what I've done, okay, I owned over 10% of the company, so uh, that would have overwhelmed my fund if I kept it long. So I had to sell off over time. No, no. Why would you own it right now? What I really like about it is it's in the it's in the part of the uh, Lasan curve where it's just pre-production. Generally, things go in a bit of hibernation. They're a little quiet. So whether the price of uranium runs or not, like a lot of people are trying to pump the uranium story, and um, that's a, that's a whole new whole new topic. That's my next question. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So in the case of next gen, there's there's going to be a value accretion between now and when they get into production, and there's also like like we talked about the, the possibility of whether it be a major global oil company taking them over. Uh, like oil was oil companies were very active in the Athabasca Basin in the 70s before Three Mile Island or whether it's the logical buyer, which I think is Cameco, um, there's, there's, there's a possibility of takeover. You can benefit from higher uranium prices, plus you're playing the Lasan curve as it moves towards production. So you got a lot of things going your way, and not all of them have to happen to make a bunch of money on it. Now, uh, getting to uh, uranium itself, uh, leaving, yeah. leaving next gen behind for now, uh, you've talked about so-called purveyors of promotion who are saying yep. there's there's a shortage of uranium yeah. and there that's the narrative now it was a similar narrative about six or seven years ago yeah. but miraculously that deficit was filled so yep. explain the, the disconnect right now right now well the big thing really is the quick and dirty is there's 180 million pounds of uranium being consumed every year and there's about 130 million or 100 or a little bit more than that being produced every year so there's about a 40 to 50 million pound deficit every year that's being made up from uh, secondary supplies coming from all over the world, feeding into the feeding into the market. So I remember about six, seven years ago, I was, tr uh, you know, I was saying, well, you know, the fundamentals, uranium look great. There's this massive supply deficit, blah blah blah. Well, surprisingly, for the last seven years, that forty to fifty million pounds a year appeared out of nowhere and continues to appear out of nowhere. And then when you open up Sprout Uranium Trust and Yellow Cake buying millions of pounds in the market, I think between the two of them, they're I, I, my recollection is Sprott's just under 60 and, uh, and Yellow Cake's around 20. So you're looking at 80 million pounds on top of, let's say, another 350 million pounds. So 430 million pounds miraculously appeared into the uranium market. And uh, so that, that's obviously the big risk to the narrative. Uh, on the demand side, demand's going to grow for sure. Uranium is definitely the future with nuclear power. But, you know, you just can't pop up these... Uh, nuclear power plants overnight. So the growth will be good and solid steady, but the, the bull case really is that this secondary supply is, being, is drying up gradually over time. So Warren, if we see a, a ramp up in the price of uranium and uranium stocks, you think it probably won't come from fundamentals, but it'll come from some hedge funds looking uh, to make some money. Yep. And you think that investors should sell into it. You say you're going to sell into yep. it. And yet you're, you're still a bull long term on uranium and yep. nuclear. So I explain that. Yeah, what the the big risk here is that uh, is that you get some the, the narrative is being pushed pretty hard in the U.S. and eventually you're going to get some multi-billion dollar hedge fund that's going to say, you know, I really like the uranium story, so I'll step into the market, I'll Hoover up a whole bunch of Kazataprom, Next Gen, uh, Cameco, and then we're going to jump into the spot market and just ramp the price of uranium up, and that'll get everybody all excited and we'll have you know you know a bit of excitement like we had last big uranium cycle. The important thing there for investors, I believe, is um, don't get suckered into it because it's uh, it's just like them trying to corner the you know what they did with the whether it be the uh, once in a while they do it with silver they just they did it with cobalt you get a bunch of people excited in the U.S. with bigger capital than we have here in the Canadian market uranium market's not that big they could really move it around if they decide to move it around on a, on a bit of a spike I'd recommend peeling off some stocks selling it to them and and uh, you know. 
have a big smile on your face <laughs> and not not end up holding the bag at the end of the right end of it. Yeah. So so you've got next gen. I understand you you also have some uranium plays that are fun and high octane, yeah. as you say. Can you can you give us some names there? Or are you well, I, I basically <laughs> said I owned a bunch of crappy uranium stocks too, so <laughs> just for octane. So I'd rather not name their All names. All right, that's fair. <laughs> but uh, I own you know I own three or four of them, and they're they're kind of fun, and they'll be the ones that. Uh, will be one of the first out of the door once uh, you know they, they double or triple in price if, if we do actually get some big money coming into the uranium space to start ramping things up. But as you say, you are a long-term bull on, on um, yeah. next-gen, uranium, yeah. nuclear. Uh, we know China's at the forefront, as, as you mentioned. Yeah. They're building something like uh, 50 reactors right now. Uh, Japan has, uh, has reverse course, Germany, many other countries. Uh, so do you think that governments and people are figuring it out now and I know you have opinions about going back to the 70s with Greenpeace yeah. and why, why yeah. this has taken so long. But are people figuring it out now that uranium and, and nuclear is, is a very safe resource? I think it's finally occurring to them that it's indeed the case. And if you even think a little bit further, you look back to the, the anti-nuclear protests of the 70s by Greenpeace and environmental groups like that and how they forced the world to burn coal for the last half century, which is a travesty in itself. Not only that, the other major travesty is they've set back R&D on the new next generation modular reactors by half a century. Fortunately, there are some people that continued research over the last half century, but it's what happened in the 70s after Three Mile Island has really, really harmed our climate and um, harmed our ability. We, we should be 50 years in advance right now with respect to R&D in the nuclear space, but we haven't spent the money in the last 50 years because of Greenpeace's activities and other other uh, anti-nuclear groups, and uh, all the result of Three Mile Island in the 70s. Right, but but you do think there are long-term opportunities in uranium for investors? Yeah, I think uranium uh, is, is the place to be. There will be some good, solid uh, uranium stories here, and um, and uh, it'll be, I think, a more much more active place than it has been the last uh, the last 10 years. Now. Uh, uh, Germany and the rest of Europe has found out that relying on Russian natural gas was not a great idea. You say the U.S. relies on Kazakhstan for about 40% of its uranium. So are we witnessing and are we in the midst of a, a shift, perhaps a permanent shift, to uh, Europe uh, and the U.S., Canada for that matter, relying more on, on Western energy, Western uranium? Yeah, that's an interesting one. You've seen recently politically Kazakhstan is trying to distance itself from Russia a little bit. So we'll see how that works out. Um, and in the U.S., they've tried to source uranium domestically, which, you know, based on my experience investing in uranium exploration companies, the um, it's not as fertile ground in the U.S. So for the Americans to say, we're going to produce uranium domestically, well, if the geology is not what it is, let's say in the northern, uh, northern Saskatchewan, the Athabasca Basin, they can do all the spending they want, but uh, I think in time, um, having an asset, and this is, goes back to next gen and, and a, to a certain extent it's chemical, having a Western source of uranium in the Athabasca Basin will be viewed very, very positively going forward, I think. Thanks uh, so much, Warren. Uh, great to see you, and we'll uh, talk to you soon. Thanks for having me, Mark. Okay, Warren Irwin, President and CIO of Rosso Asset Management. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.